Welcome to Marrow Masters, sponsored by the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, Seattle Genetics, and our esteemed link partners. The National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, established in 1992, strives to help patients, caregivers, and families cope with the psychosocial challenges of bone marrow stem cell transplant from diagnosis through survivorship. This season will focus on busting marrow myths. There are many myths related to transplant. Am I too old for a transplant? Are clinical trials exploratory and dangerous? My chronic GVHD will never end, or will it? Does palliative care mean hospice? Is our love enough to get us through this cancer? No match in my family, am I out of options? And timely info on CAR T cellular therapy as it relates to transplant as another option. Here's the host of Marrow Masters, the Executive Director of the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, Peggy Burkhardt. Greetings, welcome to another episode of Marrow Masters. Well, it's time to bust another myth. This one's centered around chronic graft versus host disease. First, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Steve Pavletic, who is a dear friend to the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link, and quite honestly, a world expert on chronic graft-versus-host disease. Dr. Pavletic received his MD and MS in immunology from the University of Zagreb School of Medicine in Croatia. In 1992, he completed a clinical fellowship in bone marrow transplantation at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and University of Washington Medical School in Seattle, Washington. In 1995, he completed his internal medicine residency at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska, and completed his hematology and oncology fellowship in June 1997. Until October 2002, Dr. Prevletic served as the director of the Allogeneic Stem Cell Transplantation Program at UNMC. In 2002, Dr. Pavletic received an appointment at the National Cancer Institute, NCI, and an adjunct appointment at the National Institute for Arthritis and Musculoskeletal and Skin Diseases at NIH. Currently, he is the head of the Graft versus Host and Late Effects section in the Immune Deficiency Cellular Therapy Program of the Center for Cancer Research, NCI. In October 2006, Dr. Pavletic received the NCI Director's Award for his achievements in developing national and international consensus guidelines for clinical trials in chronic graft-versus-host disease. He led two NIH chronic GVHD consensus conferences in 2005 and again in 2014. He is also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University Lombardi Cancer Center. Wow. Dr. Steve... It's time to bust another myth. We so often hear from patients, it feels like my chronic graft-versus-host disease will never end. Hello. I'm so glad to be here with you to discuss this very important topic for patients uh, undergoing allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. As we all know, chronic graft-versus-host disease is a man-made complication and consequence, a new disease in medicine that's caused by allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. However, allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation has evolved over the last uh, decades uh, as the best proven form of immunotherapy, more precisely, cellular immunotherapy of cancer, primarily for patients who develop hematologic malignancies like lymphoma or leukemia. At the same time, allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation can cure many other life-threatening diseases of the bone marrow like aplastic anemia, immune deficiencies, pre-leukemias, and others. So the fact that we are talking about chronic graft-versus-host disease is really reflecting the fact of the growth uh, number of uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplants that have been performed in the U.S. and worldwide, and those numbers have been growing over uh, recent decades. The success and safety of those procedures has been increasing, and uh, large number, an increasing number of patients 
are becoming long-term survivors. They survive the transplant. They are cured from the underlying disease. And they are prone to develop this late immunological complication that's called chronic graft versus host disease. The word chronic means that the disease is developing slowly, so it's not over several days. What is the case with acute graft versus host disease? Chronic graft versus host disease usually develops around six months after allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, and its average duration is between three and five years. So uh, this is why your question that chronic graft versus host disease feels like as if it will never end is something that we most commonly hear in our clinical practice. It's natural because uh, patients are, as I mentioned, most commonly, always, uh, uh, in most cases, vast majority of cases are cured from their underlying disease. They're happy. They're cured from leukemia or another life-threatening uh, disease. But then they have to deal with this complication that takes months and years until it's over. Now, the good news is that in vast majority of cases, 90% approximately situations Chronic graft versus host disease ultimately goes away, it cools down, and it's not clinically a situation where we have to give patients systemic immunosuppression like corticosteroids, cyclosporin, or many other drugs that we use nowadays for treatment of chronic graft versus host disease. So there is a definitely a light at the end of this tunnel for vast majority, but the challenge is to get through that period that can last a number of years. That includes typically wide uh, spectrum of different symptoms that affect patients' quality of life and functional status. We know that chronic graft versus host disease can involve any organ and most commonly involves eyes, oral cavity, skin, musculoskeletal system, lungs, liver, genital tract, and some others. So it can be very complicated. It makes patients more susceptible to infections or clotting problems or other metabolic problems, diabetes. So it's a very complicated situation that requires a multidisciplinary care approach and very tight relationship with an experienced transplant physician and transplant center. Working closely with a primary oncologist or primary physician in helping to overcome these obstacles to get uh, to that point where no treatments would be necessary and that patient can go back to normal life. In vast majority of situations, that normal life could mean a restoration of complete functionality. In some cases, unfortunately, complete restoration of functionality is not possible and there are some residual uh, limitations. But again, in 90% of cases, uh, we can stop. Now, there is this uh, small minority, about 10% of cases with chronic graft versus host disease that can be prolonged. They can go beyond five or seven years after diagnosis. And those are the most challenging situations where uh, uh, we still uh, are trying to find the best approaches. But certainly, again, close uh, collaboration with a team of specialists and uh, supportive care is critical and uh, certainly staying in communication for advances in therapies and science that happen every day. Well, thank you, Dr. Steve. That sure explains it. We also hear a lot about the love-hate of steroids in regards to chronic graft-versus-host disease. Could you share with us your thoughts on this? Questions uh, related to administration of corticosteroids are another group of issues and commonly asked questions and discussions taking place in the clinic when it comes to chronic graft versus host disease. We like to say that corticosteroids are our best friend in treatment of chronic graft versus host disease, at the same time, our worst enemy. And I will explain a little bit why is it the case. 
Corticosteroids are standard first-line treatment for chronic graft-versus-host disease. It is usually oral prednisone at the doses 1 milligram per kilo, what means that in average person, let's say if somebody is uh, 70 kilograms of weight, that dose would be 70 milligrams per day. That's a usual starting dose of corticosteroids. And then we try to lower the doses. We call that tapering of steroids over forthcoming several weeks to get to an approximate of 50% of the starting dose. The fact is that corticosteroids are tremendously effective and about 60 to 70% at least patients initially experience improvements in chronic graft versus host disease when we start steroids. So this is a most common, actually our standard frontline treatment for chronic graft versus host disease. Frequently, if a disease comes back and flares of disease occur, we restart higher doses of corticosteroids called corticosteroid pulses. But problem is with steroids that nobody can tolerate indefinitely those higher doses that were effective at the beginning. We need to do taper. And during that course of tapering, about 50 to 60% of patients actually develop worsening of chronic graft versus host disease. Corticosteroids in chronic graft versus host disease, because it's a chronic disease, take a long time to be delivered and given. It's uh, over weeks and months. Because of that long-term administration, there are numerous uh, early, immediate, and later or long-term side effects of corticosteroids that actually are caused by patients and their physicians really don't like steroids in the long run, and everybody tries to taper the dose and uh, stop them. And it's always a difficult conversation and decision, how fast to taper, whether to taper, whether to go back, should patient be able even to tolerate corticosteroids. I can give example just of some complications, like immediate complications. It's like glucose intolerance, basically diabetes, elevated blood pressure, emotional liability, sleep disturbance. Patients become prone to wide variety of infections, weight gain, so weakening of muscle that's called myopathy. So it becomes very difficult to walk, to get up from the chair. And there are many delayed complications after long-term administration, like avascular necrosis of the bone and joints that frequently uh, needs ultimately some surgical interventions thinning of the bones called osteoporosis, cataract, so the haziness of the ocular lens, uh, growth disturbances in children, and many others. I think this gives a good impression why corticosteroids are so much hated, as well as uh, preferentially used in the frontline therapy of chronic graft versus host disease. So to help with this, Usually, the treatment of chronic graft versus host disease includes another agent that's called steroid sparing agent. Most commonly, those agents include cyclosporin or tacrolimus, classic drugs that have been delivered with corticosteroids, but there are many new drugs that are now used for adding two steroids to allow tapering or elimination of the dose so that steroid side effects are not an issue and we can still keep control of the disease. Well, thank you. That definitely helps better understand the use of steroids. There are so many advances being made to try to curb, minimize potential GVHD. Can you share anything that might be helpful to patients and their families? This is an excellent question, of course. What you're asking is about advances in chronic graft versus host disease. The field in medicine has changed a lot over the last decade. We have much better understanding of the biology of disease and the biological processes that drive this uh, complication. And there is a long list of new molecules that can be used to be given to patients, so new drugs that 
can intervene into disease process and what well, it seems gives us a better potential to intervene and treat patient with equal or better efficacy with the less or different type of side effects. Your question is interesting as well because you are asking not only about uh, better treatments of chronic graft paralysis disease, but really how can we minimize and uh, prevent or uh, decrease the likelihood of chronic graft paralysis disease for happening. So prevention is always uh, something where we would like to be. It's always, uh, in general, in medicine, prevention is something that's always better than a therapy if the disease could be avoided. So nowadays, we are very much shifting our focus towards developing and exploring approaches how to prevent or minimize chronic graft versus host disease. In practice, these strategies are not still widely accepted or well-developed, but there are definitely some approaches how we learned to minimize occurrence of chronic graft versus host disease. Those goals could be achieved by, number one, giving to the patient around the transplant intravenous anti-lymphocyte globulins that can uh, kill or deplete uh, T cells, so immune cells infused with the graft and diminish the likelihood of developing of later chronic graft versus host disease. One approach is to give this anti-lymphocyte globulins. Second approach could be to remove T cells from the graft, so-called ex vivo T cell depletion techniques. And another approach is uh, to give high doses of cyclophosphamide early after transplant. So they call this post-transplant cyclophosphamide that as well specifically attacks uh, T lymphocytes that are rapidly growing and prone to attacking the recipient and create graft versus host disease. We know that approaches using post-transplant cyclophosphamide can decrease likelihood of chronic graft versus host disease developing. The issue is that uh, by attacking T cells in any of these different approaches that I mentioned, at the same time brings in the potential of not allowing strong enough effect directed against the patient's cancer, leukemia or lymphoma, so-called graft versus tumor effects. Anti-T lymphocyte approaches in some instances can increase likelihood of uh, infections or graft rejection. So all this is still a matter of uh, clinical trials and investigation. Sometimes we resort to using uh, bone marrow grafts instead of peripheral blood stem cells because we know that uh, those grafts can decrease likelihood of chronic graft versus host disease. So in certain patients, that would be a better option. So in summary, there are different approaches. We think there are new drugs coming that we are thinking about implementing in relatively early after transplant to interfere with these processes and achieve the best balance of decreasing the likelihood of chronic graft versus host disease and still permitting the useful anti cancer effects why allogeneic transplant is performed to start with. Well, thank you so much for that. Another question I have for you, Dr. Steve, we hear that some GVHD is good for the patient. Can you just explain why that would be so? The reason we think that little bit of GVHD, whether acute or chronic, is good because we have very strong evidence and knowledge that accumulated over years of experiences with allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is that patients who develop graft versus host disease have markedly decreased chance of malignant disease coming back. However, if graft versus host disease becomes more than minimal, then those complications can affect vital organs. We need to resort towards uh, giving to the patients immunosuppressive therapies that can increase the risk of infections and other complications. Graft versus host disease can be 
so severe in some instances to cause substantial disability affecting some vital organs like lungs or liver or severe joint contractures. So a little bit of graft versus host is good. Too much graft versus host is not good. And this is why it's so much important to recognize signs of, now in this case, chronic graft versus host disease, intervening timely, trying to prevent disease uh, to take off and uh, take its more severe forms, keep this inflammatory and aggressive process under control, and to allow time that donor immune system gets used to the new host, to the patient, to achieve this equilibrium that ultimately, what we call, we talked in the beginning, the disease and process cool down, and we can stop our medications and then hopefully have no residual damage or disability. So allowing minimum graft versus host disease in patients with a malignant disease, it's desirable, but our efforts are focused in early therapy and prevention of most severe cases. Now, there is this uh, about 10% of patients that have non-malignant disease. For example, patients with sickle cell anemia or patients with aplastic anemia or patients with some immune deficiency diseases. These are patients who don't have cancer. In those situations, graft versus tumor effect is unnecessary. And this is where we can be more aggressive in terms of preventing graft versus host disease. We are not so much or we're not at all worried about malignancy relapse. We are still worried about too much attacking those donor T cells because they are really why we are doing bone marrow transplant, right, to engraft and uh, create a new immune system. If you are too aggressive, we can have infections and graft rejections. But still, my message is that uh, in situations in diseases that are not cancer, there is no evidence that graft versus host disease is good. So we can be a little bit more aggressive in eliminating. And I think for patients who don't have cancer, it's important to know that in those instances, there is no benefit of having graft versus host disease. Thank you. Dr. Steve, I understand you have an ongoing study available at the NIH regarding chronic graft versus host disease. Can you tell me more about this and how someone might be able to apply for this opportunity? Thank you for this uh, question. We started about now 15 years ago, in 2004, a multidisciplinary clinic at the intramural program of the NIH Clinical Center. Those were times when uh, chronic graft versus host disease was not as well studied, and there was a need for putting resources together of the National Institutes of Health, particularly our intramural program here to increase focus and efforts in studying, understanding, and treating chronic graft versus host disease in a better and more organized ways. Our effort has been conducted uh, hand-to-hand with the extramural colleagues at the universities across the country, at universities internationally, in collaboration with other stakeholders like patient advocacy groups, uh, pharmaceutical industry, government agencies, and others, we put together an effort that led to NIH consensus conferences that defined the ways to study and defined directions to develop better treatments and research for chronic graft versus host disease. At the roots of these initiatives was our clinic that we formed at the NIH. We have a a natural history of chronic graft versus host disease study here. It's a protocol that includes multidisciplinary team, one week long evaluation from head to toe. Patients are seen by a team of specialists, a specialist in chronic graft versus host disease, in hematology, in uh, ophthalmology, dermatology, oral cavity disease and dentistry pain management, uh, pulmonology, other areas like uh, rehabilitation medicine, gynecology, and others that are important for studying these patients. We use this information to understand better the disease. We have now 
more than 500 patients that came to our center and they've been evaluated. At the same time, we provide exit interview and recommendations and consultation to the patient and the referring physician. And the experience has been overwhelmingly positive. Patients, the main, I have to say, it's not possible at one visit, spending one week at the NIH to address and eliminate all these uh, many problems that those patients with severe, typically severe chronic gut versus heart disease have. But unanimously, patients feel much better informed, having much better understanding of their problems. They feel being empowered in addressing a number of symptoms they have, understanding what's coming, what's going on, and certainly, you know, they received a treatment recommendations, and sometimes they fit into some of our investigational studies that we have at the NIH that we develop new treatments and medications that would have a better potential for treatment of chronic graft versus host disease. So that's our uh, main protocol that we have here, this one-week comprehensive evaluation. But there are a number of other studies that are going on here and then those are as well discussed in those uh, communications with patients and their referring physicians. Dr. Steve, is this a free clinic opportunity for patients? Well, that's a very important question. Uh, the way National Institutes of Health Clinical Center operates is we are a specialist hospital in terms that all patients who are treated here are on an investigational protocol. So this is the largest hospital in the world that's completely dedicated to research. So each single patient has to be participant in some interventional or non-interventional observational studies. However, whoever qualifies for an NIH study and a protocol, then these services come at no charge to the patient or patient's insurance. So in that regard, that's a free of charge Whatever medical services are conducted here, they are paid for by the U.S. government. There are some assistance programs that can be provided in patients that may have some financial uh, challenging situations, uh, and then uh, our social workers uh, work with them. But typically, this is only if it comes down to issues being uh, related to compensation for the travel or housing here locally, but overwhelmingly costs of care and even enrollment and treatment on a research protocol are covered by the study. It has to be said that we work very closely with the referring physicians. We don't keep patients here unless in some emergency situations. So we work very closely with the referring physicians. Patients go back to their care and they come here periodically for follow-up appointments. Thank you so much. I will be sure to include a link for that in the show notes so that people can learn more about that opportunity. Absolutely. Dr. Steve, would you be able to touch on some new therapies such as Imbruvica? Absolutely. I want to emphasize that what I mentioned before, when we started the clinic at the NIH and chronic GVHD program, those were very different times. We realized that chronic graft versus host disease is a serious medical problem and growing in its incidence and importance in patients after allogeneic transplantation and that our understanding and ability to develop new treatments has been very limited and lagging behind this unmet clinical need. So about 10, 15 years ago, it was impossible for us to conduct protocols or clinical investigations for chronic graft versus host disease because we didn't have developed clinical criteria to assess responses to therapies that are standardized. We didn't have standardized criteria to diagnose or stage or grade severity of chronic graft versus host disease. A number of other things were not in place and the consequence was that it was next to impossible to test new treatments for chronic graft versus host disease because, for example, Food and Drug Administration, the main regulatory agency in the U.S. that approves safety and promise of new treatments, 
couldn't approve any new agents because we didn't have developed ways of doing clinical trials. So thanks to those massive communal efforts of all stakeholders in the field, ultimately we created an environment where forces that are heavily involved in uh, developing new treatments academically and in industry decided to focus more on new approaches and they thought that finally the opportunity and the model for clinical trials was here that we can hopefully advance our treatments of chronic graft versus host disease, take the advantage of the long list of new drugs that may be coming in medicine, and now we can apply in chronic graft versus host disease. Until several years ago, we didn't have a single agent that had a Food and Drug Administration approved indication for chronic graft versus host disease. And finally, in 2017, Ibrutinib or Imbruvica was the first in history drug that got FDA approval for chronic graft versus host disease indication. So there was a huge excitement because there's not only signaled that now there's a formal new option for patients to use for chronic graft versus host disease after failure of steroids, but at the same time, it signaled that the times have changed and there are pathways and opportunities that are available for new drug development in this area. And what we are seeing now, there's a lots of increased interest in this field and new treatments being tested and addressed. And I'm very hopeful that we're going to have many, many more new additional options uh, in the next five years or so or less for chronic graft versus host disease. So this is the importance of Imbruvica, the first drug that was formally made available and registered by the FDA as treatment for chronic graft versus host disease. Certainly, it's an agent that uh, works very well in some patients. In some patients, uh, success is limited. In some patients, there's some intolerance, like any other drug that we have available for chronic graft versus host disease. So I think it certainly improved our ability to reach out, to have more options, to, in some instances, it's very much important that insurance companies would be reimbursing this uh, if it's an FDA approved for certain indication. But it's a great beginning, but still much more work that needs to be done. Dr. Steve, as we wind down here, is there any story of a particular patient that you might want to share that would offer some hope to people listening, people that are just in despair, they're just exhausted, they're wiped out? Anything you want to add as we finish this interview? Well, the main story I can share is that there is the light at the end of the tunnel that seems to be so frustrating and so difficult to go through. There are people out there, medical teams, uh, advocacy groups, patient families, other resources and people who are thinking hard and trying to find ways and improve possibilities how to make these complications less common, less frustrating, and uh, hopefully someday we can say that we re- reach the point that uh, chronic graft versus host disease in its severe forms is a history. But the story I would like to share, it's uh, twofold. I'm uh, tremendously impressed with the patients who come to our clinic with their resilience and faith in the good outcome ultimately. I'm most impressed with their altruism. They come here, they seek help, and they want the best for themselves. But at the same time, there's an unbelievable dose of desire to help others by using their examples, by participating in clinical trials when I see them coming at the NIH. So that monumental amount of altruism that goes with this uh, quite substantial and sometimes monumental amount of suffering, it's something that it's really stunning and uh, I would say the most impressive message that I get from uh, working with this patient population The light of hope is that um, it's unbelievable amount of new knowledge that's been developed, virtual around the corner, and again, 
In 90% of situations, ultimately, we are able to regain control of the process and this disease goes away. What patients can do for themselves, I would say, number one, don't be hard on yourself. It's nothing that you did wrong. You know, you actually, you've done yourself and your family everything that you could. You're doing the right thing. It's nobody's fault. Work very closely with your uh, healthcare providers. Don't be shy with sharing what's going on. Actually, we like patients sharing rather more than less in terms of what's <laughs> going on. Uh, so we can all timely intervene and help to get through this difficult period of their lives. And again, vast majority of patients with chronic graft versus host are cured of the underlying le- reason why the transplant was performed. So it's always a, something good to keep in mind. And uh, again, there is a light at the end of this tunnel. There are many people that are going to be with you on that journey and as well uh, at the end of the process sharing the good outcomes. It's really invigorating to see patients who went through all that period and they regain complete functionality of their status. They're back to normal lives. They take leading and prominent roles in different areas of uh, endeavors. Some of them became uh, passionate and the most prominent patient advocates. Some of them are even uh, serving and having prominent roles in uh, patient advocacy groups as leaders and trying to share their experiences and try to help others. And actually trying, and they are helping physicians in understanding better the other side of the coin and uh, informing our efforts so we can do a better job ourselves in approaching to this very complicated uh, disease in medicine. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Steve Pavletic. You're so inspiring. I love this. I love the altruism aspect. I never thought about that before. We see that with all the patients yeah. at the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link. They really do want to help the next round of people that are going to go through this. And we are so lucky to have this knowledge and this support from you. So thank you and appreciate your time. Well, I appreciate your tremendous work that you're doing at the MBMT Link. Uh, thank you so much. This has been the Marrow Masters Podcast. Feel free to share this episode via social media, text, or email. To hear more, subscribe for free to Marrow Masters in your favorite podcast app. To learn more about the resources available to patients and caregivers, check out the National Bone Marrow Transplant Link at nbmtlink.org. That's nbmtlink.org. Or just tap the link below in the show notes.